I'll just start with some acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, to say thank you for inviting me, and particular to Frederick for organizing it. And a usual disclaimer that um, I'm quite a cynic about personalized medicine, but many people I work with are not, and might, they might be very anxious not to be associated with what I'm about. So these are my personal views. Uh, and also to acknowledge uh, the grants behind this, um, this is supported by the European Union's Seventh Framework Program under the IDEAL project, which was led by uh, Dieter Hilgers in um, Aachen. Surprise, well, why exactly, what has, what have rare diseases got to do with personalized medicine? Well, the reason is that if ultimately we have to personalize everything, then all diseases become rare. So the whole process of personalization is essentially making disease groups smaller and smaller. So there definitely is a connection. So I'm going to start with an example. This example is the sort of thing that should give us a case for personalized medicine. This is a crossover trial in asthma. And I used to work a lot in the field of asthma when I was in the pharmaceutical industry. And one of the things you learned was that there is a gold standard for response in asthma using the measure forced expiratory volume in one second, which the FDA always uses. They classify an individual who had a 15% or more increase from baseline as being a responder and one who did not achieve 15% as being a non-responder. So this is a way in which you can dichotomize the world for patients having been treated into responders and non-responders. So here we have a diagram. Two treatments are being compared. It's a crossover trial. Every patient got treatment A and got treatment B. And so what I can do is I can plot a response in this two-dimensional space here, and I've drawn those magic lines of 15%. A vertical line of 15% being uh, the boundary for response under treatment A. And I have a horizontal line at 15% being the boundary for response under treatment B. And I've used a little color coding here. Uh, those who are in yellow are those who responded under neither treatment. Those uh, who have the gray triangles responded under both treatments. Those who have the blue diamonds responded under B but not A. And those who have the uh, red squares responded under A but not under B. And so what one could say is looking at this particular diagram, and certainly that's what many people would include, that there's a clear case for personalized medicine here. Clearly some patients do better under B, some patients do better under A because it doesn't really matter which. And so surely the task is for us to try and find out how can we predict which patient should be given A and which patient should be given B. I shall come back to this example later. As I say, it must be a green light for medicine, mustn't it? So, part one of the problem is the following. I'm going to maintain we don't have reliable figures on the scope for personalized medicine. So here's an example for you, a question for you to test what you think, what you think subjectively yourself should correspond to response for headache. So Miss Smith had her headache reduced from eight hours duration to six. She would have had a headache of eight hours under placebo. Instead, given paracetamol, she had a headache of six hours. Did she or did she not have a response to treatment? Mr. Jones, on the other hand, had his headache duration reduced two hours and five minutes to one hour and 55 minutes. This is a reduction of 10 minutes or 8%. So the question is, did Mr. Jones have a response or not? Well, actually, I can tell you that the International Headache Society knows the answer to this. They know that Mr. Jones had a response, and they know that Miss Smith did not have a response. Why? Because the magic boundary is two hours. If your headache goes on beyond two hours, it's irrelevant whether it lasted two hours or five minutes, or whether it lasted for three days. That really makes no difference to your suffering whatsoever. It's absolutely completely irrelevant. On the other hand, if your headache was reduced from two hours and five minutes to one hour and fifty-five minutes, wow, that's a response. That really is something that the treatment did for you. And at the bottom, when you have a look at most claims in people with responders and non-responders, you have some sort of boundary like this. So I'm on Twitter a lot, probably not uh, up far more often than I ought to be. That's certainly my daughter's opinion, I think. Um, but I point out to my daughter that it is the function of fathers to embarrass their daughters. That is basically one of the reasons we're put on earth. Um, so this is what I happen to see on Twitter. I follow the cop in UK and they said, only 10% of people with tension type headaches get a bit of benefit from paracetamol. And I'm a very nasty person. And basically, as soon as I see a statement like that, I regard it as being a challenge to prove it's wrong. 
So basically, I accepted the challenge, how can I prove that this particular statement that Cochrane put out is wrong? And when you had a look at the data on which it was based, it was as follows. They'd done a meta-analysis of 6,000 individuals. They had obtained data from a number of clinical trials for 6,000 individuals entered into clinical trials who had the headaches treated either with placebo or with paracetamol. And they found the following, that 59% had no headache after two hours when treated with paracetamol. 49% had no headache after two hours when treated with placebo. The difference between 59% and 49% is 10%. 1 over 10% is 10. This is known as a need to treat. You would need to treat 10 people with paracetamol to have more response than you would have under placebo. And then the conclusion is, well, that must mean, mustn't it, that in fact paracetamol only works for one patient in 10. So just to sum up, meta-analysis of placebo-controlled paracetamol intention headache. There were 23 studies, 6,000 patients in total, and the outcome measure was simply whether a patient was pain free or not after two hours. But, in fact, the conclusion about the proportion of patients uh, cannot be drawn from such studies. I maintain you cannot separate headaches and patients, and in fact, the dichotomy causes confusion. And here's a motto for you. We tend to believe the truth is in there, but sometimes it isn't, and the dangers we will find it anyway. And it seems to me that a lot of people involved in big data analytics are essentially engaged in finding truths that don't exist and then marketing them as solutions for mankind. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to create a simple statistical model, the simplest of all possible models for survival of headache over time. How long can a headache last? I'm going to use the exponential distribution, the simplest model for time uh, to event. And I'm then going to assume that what happens to paracetamol it has a proportionate effect on the duration that people would have under placebo. I'm going to use a form of cell analysis model, very, very famous, uh, due to Sir David Cox, proposed at a red paper in 1972, um, the, the proportional hazards model. And I'm going to then use a dichotomy. I'm going to use the International Headache uh, Society standard of two hours. And based on this standard, I'm going to classify every headache as being a response or a non-response. And I'm then going to show you the results. And I'll show you that we'll be tempted to conclude that some don't benefit and some do, but that this conclusion is false. So, the numerical recipe is as follows. I shall generate 6,000 headaches under placebo. You must remember, I am the god of this universe. I declare what happens in this universe. I declare how long every single headache will be, and I'm going to use it doing the um, exponential model. And I'm going to use an exponential distribution with a mean of just under three hours, 2.97 hours to be exact. Then, each such duration will be multiplied by just over three quarters. That's to say, the placebo duration will be converted to a duration under paracetamol by reducing that duration by one quarter, by making sure that the new duration is three quarters of the placebo one. Then what I'm going to do is I shall take the 6,000 pairs, one of which is of necessity counterfactual, because I cannot observe the same headache treated twice, I can only observe the same headache once. I'm going to randomly erase one of the 6,000, one of the members of the 6,000 pairs, leaving with 3,000 placebo and 3,000 paracetamol headaches. And I'm then going to analyze the data. So these are the two survival curves here. This black curve is the curve under placebo. And the time was chosen by me precisely because at two hours it would yield a probability response of 49%, of 0.49, exactly the that Cochrane saw. Then what I did was I took every such headache, every point on this particular curve, and I shifted to the left by a certain amount, increased uh, re the rapidity with which a headache would be cured, I reduced the time to resolution of headache, and I created the paracetamol curve. And this is the red curve here, and you'll see that by doing that, what I've done is I've also so uh, created exactly the probability that Cochrane saw. I created a 59% probability response. But the point you have to appreciate is that the red curve is 
created from the black curve. Every point on the black curve has been shifted a particular proportionate amount to the left to create the red dashed curve. And this is the paracetamol distribution. Here are some examples of some particular headaches that I could generate from the 6,000 there. Uh, and what I've been able to do here is because, as I say, I'm the god of this universe, I can see what would happen under placebo, I could see what would happen under paracetamol. These headaches all fall on a particular line. This is the line of equality. The, the diagonal red line is the line of equality, dashed red line. The blue circles fall on another imaginary line. That's the line that gives you the benefit of paracetamol. That tells you by what proportion paracetamol reduces every headache. Now what I do is I apply the incredibly stupid way of looking at patients, dichotomizing them according to a headache having gone at two hours or not, as if nature cares about these particular human uh, definitions that we use. And what you will see is, is that a certain proportion of headaches then fall in the area in which they would respond to paracetamol only. These in the top right hand uh, area would respond to neither, and the neither paracetamol nor under placebo is the duration of the headache less than two hours. These down here in the bottom left hand corner would respond under both, and what we have is we have a number of headaches that respond, respond under paracetamol. Well, so far, I've only gone halfway in my simulation recipe. I haven't erased one member of the pair. I'm now going to do that because one of the members of the pair is a necessity counterfactual. I cannot observe placebo and paracetamol response at the same time. If I run a parallel group trial, I have to allocate a patient to either get the paracetamol or to get the placebo. Uh, so this is the idea behind it. Here we have a counterfactual experiment, one I actually can't run. The uh, red circle, the red open circle, is the response of the headache under placebo, and the blue square gives you the response under paracetamol. That's what ideally, if I was a, an all-knowing, uh, all-seeing, all-predicting individual is what I would like to be able to tell you about, but I can't do that. I can only observe one of these, and so I randomly erase one of these, and we're now left with this particular confusing diagram. The diagram on the right is typically what you see from a parallel group trial. And you will see there's considerable overlap between, blue circles, between red circles and blue squares. And people often make the stupid mistake of assuming that that means that not all individuals respond. It doesn't. It simply means it's very difficult to determine response at all. And typically what you need is you need a large number of patients in a parallel group trial for the mean from the uh, <coughs> blue squares to differentiate itself from the mean from the red circles in a reliable way in which you can conclude that paracetamol must work for at least some patients, otherwise you wouldn't see a difference between them. This is the same thing on the log scale. Here we have a constant difference in the left-hand diagram. The difference between the two members of the counterfactual pair is always constant. I always reduce the placebo headache by one quarter in order to get the paracetamol one. That will lead to a constant difference on the log scale. And the parallel group trial, I simply can't cover this particular information. But parallel group trials is what we run. That's primarily what we have to base our impression of who responds and who doesn't in clinical trials on. This now, these now are the cumulative distribution curves the black one for placebo, and the red one for, uh, for paracetamol. That's actually empirical. That's the <coughs> smooth empirical plot on top of the data points that I got, and you will see that it fits my theory very well. And that means that it also produces pretty much exactly the response that Cochrane saw, and what that means is that my theory is pretty good, or either I made the same mistake in my simulation I made in my theory, and that would be the first time that somebody but I'm pretty confident that I have got here uh, an economical explanation of the Cochrane collaboration results. I want to make it quite clear, I don't know that this explanation is true. In fact, I can even go further than that. I can say, I suspect it's not true. I suspect it's far too simple, and the reality is far more complicated than that. All I'm saying is that nothing in the data presented in the Cochrane collaboration re review tells me it's wrong. For all anybody knows, me, you, them, this is right. 
And this corresponds to every single headache, not just every single patient, every single headache having had its duration reduced by one quarter by, by the patient having been had paracetamol rather than placebo. So these are some statistics for responder under paracetamol, under placebo rather, I get for this simulated example a mean of 0.48, remember Cochran found 0.49, and I get for the simulated uh, paracetamol results a mean of 0.459, which is exactly what Cochran got. So the simulation mimics exactly what Cochran found. It does not justify any conclusion that only some of the patients benefit from treatment. So, to sum up, they are consistent with paracetamol having the same effect on every single headache. It doesn't have to be the case, but we don't know it isn't. The combination of dichotomies and responder analysis has great potential to mislead. Thinking of things in this particular way is potentially misleading. It involves naive views of causality, and it's a shortcut to uh, <coughs> thinking incorrectly about response. Responders, researchers are assuming that because some patients responded and some don't, that this is an argument for personalized medicine. Now, to give you an example, here we have the prime author of the current problem that the United King Kingdom faces, the mover behind Brexit, a former Prime Minister, David Cameron. Uh, and this is what he has to say about uh, progress in genetics. The agreement will see the UK lead the world in genetic research within years. I'm determined to do all I can to support the health and scientific sector to unlock the power of DNA. That's the sort of things that politicians say. Power of DNA. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? Turning an important scientific breakthrough into something that will help deliver better tests, better drugs, and above all, better care for patients. It's really rousing stuff, isn't it? But we can go back further. We can go back 20 years, 1997. This is Sir Richard Sykes, fellow of the Royal Society, who was at the time the chief executive officer of Glaxo Welcome, a major pharmaceutical company, now extremely worried about the effects of Brexit, by the way. Um, we have him, uh, and he was also about to become rector of Imperial College in, uh, in London, one of the great universities in the United Kingdom. Although as a former UCL man, it always pains me to have to say that sort of thing. Um, and uh, he's talking here about genetic tests, individuals respond favorably to the drug based on their genotype, smaller, more effective clinical trials. We all know that has happened. Anybody who looks at the bill, the money that's been paid by the pharmaceutical industry for clinical trials, the first thing that strikes me is, wow, it's all got a lot cheaper since 1997, hasn't it? An individual patient will be targeted with specific treatment, personalized dosing regimens, etc., etc. Here we have a paper not so long ago from Shork in Nature 2015. And what he did was he took the 10 most best selling drugs in, in the US and he took them to the treat, in other words, exactly the same sort of figure that Cochrane was reporting for the headache data. And he interpreted them straight away, and it's a, it's a mistake. He interpreted them straight away as telling you uh, that between 3 and 24 people respond uh, are needed to um, uh, fail to improve the condition of 3 to 24 people. In other words, here, for example, we have a number of of 4. That means one person benefited and 3 did. Utter nonsense. This simply does not follow. A number needed to treat does not tell you this for the very simple reason I told you, the example I gave you in the, uh, in the headache data. In fact, not only are these data, do these data not tell you what Shork think they did, but they're not even correct in his terms either. For instance, adver discus is not a treatment for asthma here. This particular figure he quotes is for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is not the same disease. And here, uh, actually, the author for Symbalta Depression, the particular trial here, I think, of the meta-analysis, the number they treat, as far as I can tell, uh, was six to seven, according to the source, and not nine, as short change. So essentially, these are data that people don't really own in any particular way. They just put out there, but then subsequently, people like me get incredibly irritated, because every time I say, well, you know, where's the proof that we really have this, got this vast proportion of patients don't respond, they say, well, haven't you seen Short's nature piece? And so I said, well, yes, I have seen it. What I don't understand is why it proved to the case. We could have a look at the uh, FDA document of 2013. 
paving the way for personalized medicine. By the way, they also considered a sort of uh, headache. A migraine is not quite the same as headache, but somewhat similar, let's say, in some of the symptoms. Uh, and what they have here is they have a number of particular diseases, which they're categorizing according to the number of people who don't respond. 38% don't respond in depression, 40% not in asthma, 48% don't respond in migraine, apparently, and so forth, 75% in cancer. What does that mean? 75% of people don't respond in cancer. Well, is that a mixture of all cancers? Because that's a very strange statement to make then in that case. If you take testicular cancer, thank goodness for uh, pharmaceutical breakthroughs, what we can now say is that the five-year survival rate, I think, is somewhat in excess of 95%, and a high proportion of patients can effectively consider themselves good. If we take up lung cancer, not so good. So actually, we already know that it's personalized in that particular way. We already know that you don't necessarily treat testicular cancer the way, same way you treat lung cancer. And we also know that the survival prospects are not exactly the same for these two particular diseases. But here we have the FDA, the premier regulatory agency in the world, putting out these particular figures. But the first thing I want to know on seeing something like this is, how do they know? How do the FDA know that these particular things are true? Well, uh, the FDA actually tell you. They tell that they got it from this particular article, Trends in Molecular Medicine. Now, I have to give the FDA some credit here because here you'll see that the diseases are, are sorted alphabetically. And the FDA have learned a good, good data presentation result, and that is that you su should support by, you should sort by importance and not alphabetically. So let's give the agency some credit for that particular thing. The second thing is, the second thing is that they've actually decided it's more important to concentrate on the need rather than that which can solve successfully. So what they've done is they've subtracted these particular figures uh, that you have here, the efficacy rate, they subtracted it from 100. So what is a 30% efficacy rate becomes a 70% failure to have efficacy rates. So let's give the uh, FDA some credit for that. But what is this in the middle? Here we have a group of Irish dancers who are not allowed to put their head, hands up. And here we have a group of Scottish dancers who are allowed to go around like this. And this is supposed to tell us something. But in the words of meatloaf, two out of three ain't bad. So I suppose I have to give the agents some credit. But I'm here I'm interested about this. How did uh, Spear, Heath, Kiotzi, and Huff, how did they know what they knew? And also, why? Why is the FDA in 2013 citing data from 2001 to tell you what the problem is with the US pharmaceutical industry? Because basically, does the FDA not think that there's been some progress in 12 years? If they don't, then what on earth are they there for? Can't we just simply abandon drug development altogether? But actually, you can find out from Spear, Kiotzi, and Huff where they got it from. Where did they get it from? Well, here. They studied the physician's desk reference. They studied the physician's desk reference. They don't tell you how they studied it. There's no way you could take the physician's desk reference. There's no way that you could actually check that the figures that they give you are correct. But I can tell you one thing, although I'm no physician, the physician's desk reference could not possibly tell you this. And as far as I'm aware, all attempt to try and establish the basis for the claims about the report of people who respond and don't respond, they always end in something like this. And these are what may be called zombie statistics. They simply refuse to die. You can talk about them as much as you like. You can try and put a state of their heart. No, that's vampires, isn't it? But whatever you do with, with uh, zombies, you blow them to pieces or whatever, something like that, you can try it but you'll always find they come back again. Somebody at some stage in the future will again cite this FDA document for you as if it's gospel truth that this tells you the proportion of individuals who respond and don't respond. And so what I say is that not only are the claims made by Shaw on the one hand and the FDA on the other not right, they're not even wrong. You wouldn't even know exactly, you couldn't even pin down what it was meant to say so that you could say it doesn't mean that. Uh, and even if, the, as I say, even if they were right in some numerical sense, they wouldn't mean what they assumed to mean. And so here's a nice quote from Vic Reeves, 88.2% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Uh, and basically, I think that's more or less true of all of these personalized medicine statistics. They're just made up on the spot, basically. But in the meantime, there's an edge in the room, as the philosophers like to say. 
there's a particular thing that everybody knows. Is it really the case that the major source of variation in the healthcare system is patients? No, it's doctors. Variation in practice is so large that it cannot be justified by variation in patients. And in fact, Brent James was a physician who became very interested in the teachings of W.E. Deming, the guru of quality control, became convinced that what you need to do, you need to understand the variation in the system if you want to improve healthcare. And the truth is that we're not even doing average medicine well, because even where we have established what an average guideline should be, you will find that many different positions use different approaches to treating the same disease, and they can't all be right. So here's an example for you. These are uh, tonsillectomy rates for England by local authority, and these are elective tonsillectomies in uh, young persons, persons aged under 15, and uh, these are the raw estimates and 95% confidence interval, so you can work out, assuming some sort of Poisson variation, you can work out what the confidence interval would be. Some of them are not very well established, but nevertheless, it looks as if the rate uh, varies by more than just chance. And here I've done, the, I've done a shrunk estimate, so that's the line of equality, and the crosses here are the shrunk estimates. So the shrunk estimate on the y-axis and the raw estimate on the x-axis, and what you find is the variation from minimum to maximum is almost five. And I put it to you that that sort of variation is almost impossible to explain in terms of difference in need. Some doctors are whipping out tonsils far too often, or some of them not often enough, and I have my suspicions about which way around it was. Uh, so Frederick mentioned the first job, which is working for the National Health Service. My boss at the time, very kind physician called Dr. Fisher a man I really respected. He came in one day and I said to him, Dr. Sichel, why are you looking so pale? And he said, I have to explain to some parents why their daughter died. And I said, why did she die? And they said, well, they decided that she should have her tonsils taken out for proper lighting purposes. They thought it was a good idea. And the consultant did it privately and he then left and she started to bleed. And the registrar panicked, didn't keep records and he overtransfused her and she died. And he had to tell her about that. And we've known about the variation of tonsillectomy long before these particular data here. We've known about this since the 1920s and 1930s, and nothing happens about it. A lot of variation in the system is doctors. Here is another example. Here is a paper from uh, Sheffield, admittedly from uh, over 10 years ago, Colden et al., and they looked at 11 units in Trent region to try and see whether you could explain the difference in attitude, what happens to a woman who has a cancer detected by a scan, what happens to her then, and what they found is that there's a huge variation in the ratio of observed to expected mastectomies. So they're just using the average mastectomy rate according to a particular model for uh, patient characteristics, and what they find is they find a variation of a lower rate down here to a rate up here. So a huge variation between one, one particular unit which is doing it far more often than the other particular unit. I wonder how many of the terrified women who present to their doctor at this particular stage know that the most important thing that determines what happens to them next is just the luck of which who happens to be their doctor. That is the thing which determines what happens to them next. Something as serious as that. So Brent James's advice to the doctors in Mountain Health is, guys, it's more important to do it the same way than what you think is the right way. The same way having been something that all the doctors together, having looked at the evidence-based guidelines, have decided the right way to do things. And the way in which they run health there is they give the doctors the freedom to do what they want to, but they have regular case reviews every quarter or something like that, and all cases are reviewed, and gradually what they find is that people converge to a common policy. So some notes towards possible solutions. I like to think of source of variation in clinical trials like this. There's between treatments. That's why we do them. We hope or we think or we're trying to find out whether the treatment's different. Between patients, main effects of patients, we know that's the case. We know that not all patients have got the same forced exposure volume in one second at baseline. They differ in terms of the degree of asthma that they have. 
Patient by treatment interaction. This is what everybody is fixated on in individualized therapy. The idea that treatment that was good for you might not be good for me, and so on. So on. You can actually find the right treatment for you. The fact that there will be a variation in response depending on the treatment, who you are and the treatment you're given. And this one that people tend to overlook within patients. If you measure 465 volume one second in a patient on separate occasions, you find you don't get the same answer. It varies from occasion to occasion. These are what you can identify in a clinical trial. If a parallel group trial, these three sources of variation simply come together. You cannot separate them from each other. If a crossover trial, each patient receives each treatment in one period, um, then in that case, you can separate out <coughs> um, the between patient variation and, of course, the treatment effect which you're trying to get, but the between, within patient variation, the interaction will still be uh, together. However, if what you can do is treat patients uh, with each treatment in at least two periods, and that's possible for some diseases, then it would be possible, in fact, treating headaches. Imagine you actually decide to study four headaches for each patient, two under placebo, two under paracetamol, then in that case you can separate out all of these particular uh, sources of variation. So I'm going to give you a thought experiment. Imagine a crossover trial on hypertension. Patients are going to be randomized uh, to receive either uh, an ACE2 inhibitor or a placebo in random order. And then we're going to do it again. So... In each pair of periods, the patient will receive placebo once and paracetamol once, and there will be two such pairs. Then we can compare each patient's response under ACE2 to placebo twice. So these are the sequences we could use. In every pair of periods, uh, a patient will receive A or B. Uh, and so here's one possible sequence, A followed by B, and again A followed by B. Here's another one, A followed by B, but B followed by A, and so forth. Those are the four possible sequences we would randomize patients to, and that means that in every pair of periods, we could actually compare the treatment effect. So here is a plot. This is one particular patient here. This is the difference to placebo, uh, diastolic blood pressure in millimeters of mercury, uh, and uh, this particular patient has had a very dramatic reduction, 15 millimeters uh, on one occasion, on the second occasion, uh, nearly 20 millimeters on the first occasion. Otherwise, what I've done, I've done a color coding again. I've used here a response boundary of five millimeters. That's rather more modest than often used in hypertension. But remember, this is a difference to placebo, not a difference to baseline. It's five millimeters compared to placebo. And uh, the people uh, I've, I've uh, highlighted in blue are those who responded on both occasions. Those highlighted in red are those who responded on neither occasion, and those highlighted in, uh, in orange responded on one occasion but not the other. And here there's a clear correlation. I can see from the fact that I've studied the effect of, of um, the ACE inhibitor compared to placebo on two occasions, I can see that the response itself is correlated. Uh, and if I try and put in statistics, just using the dichotomy, which I don't like, but just accepting that for the moment, then in that case, I can calculate the conditional probability of observed response. Uh, 838 individuals responded on the first crossover, and of those, 781 responded on the second. So that means that the conditional probability of your responding a second time, given I saw you respond on the first time, is uh, nearly 80%, uh, sorry, is 90%, is excess of 90%. But here's the surprise, perhaps. Don't give up hope. Just because you didn't respond on the first occasion doesn't mean you won't on the second. Actually, 4% of those who didn't respond on the second on the first did on the second. Here's another example, though. Same setup, different result. This time, there's no particular correlation. And now, if I have a look, what I find is that response on one occasion is completely unpredictive of response under another. Here, it simply is that you have an 80% chance of responding, but the fact that on one occasion is not predictive of your response on another. Essentially, the patients are just completely interchangeable in regard. So what's this? This is the marginal distribution from one crossover, from one crossover. And now the question is, which does it apply to? Does it apply to the first case, or does it apply to the second case? And the answer is, I don't know. It was only the fact that I was prepared to study 
patients more than once under each treatment, which enabled me to produce the bivariate plot. It's the bivariate plot that enables me to identify the responders. Just having marginal distributions like this won't work. A crossover trial on its own is not good enough. A parallel trial is certainly not good enough. You need to have repeated use of treatment in order to identify the links. So all I can say is that you need to have a sufficiently rich design. Uh, even repeated measures would help. That requires suitable model. Actually, the uh, PK modeling school back in the 1970s, people like Louis Shiner, they started doing this. They started putting nonlinear random effect models in an attempt to try and tease out personal response. They know that you can do this with enough effort and enough intelligence and enough statistical know-how. But the message that they've been largely ignored, I know from having worked in the pharmaceutical industry, it's incredibly difficult to get marketing to go down the route of using pharmacokinetics as a way of deciding what dose patients should get. So, a complex design in asthma. I'm not going to tell you more about my first example. I gave you my first example. I invited you to think that my first example showed that some patients responded under B and not under A and vice versa. This is actually a design. Uh, I helped a trial I helped to design in, uh, my, during my time at Sibagaygi. We were trying to develop a new formulation, uh, MTA, of formotrol. Formotrol is a long-acting beta agonist. It's used for patients with asthma. It uh, <coughs> expands their lungs. It enables them to breathe more easily. Easily, It increases their force exposure to volume in one second. Um, and I... Uh, we came to the conclusion we needed seven treatments. We needed three doses of the existing formulation, that's one, and three doses of the new formulation. The formulations were identical in the sense that they both had dry powder in them, and the molecule was the same, but the device used was different. In one case, it was like a single loading rifle. You could have one shot, and then you need to reprime the whole thing. In the second case, it was like a machine gun. You could keep on pressing, and you get more shots. And so it was useful for the patient. It was convenient but to have a second one. But registration had been for the first one, and so to try and obtain registration for the second one, we're going through a full development program. What we did was we had uh, a parallel uh, assay design. We came to the conclusion we wanted seven treatments, but then we got the bad news from the, from the medics. There's no way we can persuade people to come into the clinic seven times. We can give you five periods. That's all we can do. And so then, a nice challenge for me, not that difficult, but at least a little bit more interesting than the, the standard sort of stuff. I had to find sequence of balance such a design. I found a design with 21 sequences. So each patient was given a subset of the seven treatments, five of the seven, in one of the 21 sequences. I was worried that our trial logistics department would not be able to do this, so I telephoned them. This is in the days before email. Uh, and I said, what's the maximum number of treatment groups that you can handle? Each sequence would be a group. And I received the answer, 26. Wow, that's fantastic. They can manage 21. <coughs> this is the most complex design that had ever been run by Siba Geige in terms of the number of groups. I was really, what's, this, what's the phrase, the bullshit bingo phrase, I was pushing the envelope here, or whatever, <laughs> something like that, anyway. Uh, so I, I was really pushing the envelope here, but then I suddenly thought, why 26? So I asked them the question, why 26? And they said, there are only 26 letters in the alphabet. <laughs> so what they had was, they had a uh, packaging system which would give a label to each sequence and uh, no right mind could ever want more than 26 groups in the clinical trial, so just a letter of the alphabet was enough. And so it just goes to show that sometimes the smaller detail is important in knowing how to run a trial. But anyway, <clears throat> we, <clears throat> in the end we had 158 patients, Force expired to volume in one second. These are the time points which you measure. This is just one course of one particular treatment. This is ISF 24 micrograms over time. The average effect over time for a number of patients. And these are the measurement intervals here. And we use AUC of FEV1 as the main outcome. Uh, these, by the way, are the uh, comparisons to placebo under the model, having fitted the model with patient effect, period effect, in addition to treatment effect. And this gave us an incredible shock. This is a perfect dose response. 6, 12, 24 of the new formulation. 6, 12, 24 of the old formulation. 
what you'll see is that 24 micrograms of the new formulation is not as powerful as six of the existing formulation. That particular project was cancer. And I felt very proud. I had killed a product dead. <laughs> I did that. At least I had a big part in killing that particular product dead. And I can tell you from having worked in the pharmaceutical industry, it's quite hard to kill projects. There's always somebody sufficiently creative to find some sort of subgroup in which it appears that the treatment might have had an effect and it will limp on its misery. But I actually killed that particular project, or why and my colleagues did. Uh, so, now I'm going to reveal to you what these two particular treatments were. B was ISF24. It was this one here. This is A, and that's ISF12. And now I can tell you, it's almost inconceivable that a patient could find that ISF-12 gave them better bronchodilation than ISF-24. There would have to be something really weird about dose response curves if that was the case, and I really don't think that that is the case. So then the question is, how is it possible for patients to respond under ISF-12 when they didn't respond under ISF-24? And the reason is the following. First of all, stupid science on dichotomies. Secondly, stupid counterfactuals comparison to baseline. Thirdly, ignoring within subject variation. Ignoring the fact that from occasion to occasion, individuals can, can vary. I personally do not believe that individuals exist who would respond better in terms of bronchodilation to 12 uh, micrograms for mortal than 24. So here's my advice. Don't let the label responder infect your brain. A responder is a patient who is observed to get better by some arbitrary standard. A responder is not a patient who was caused to get better by the drug. Subsequence is not consequence. Things change anyway. To establish who really responds and who does not use, you need to work very very hard and never, ever, ever use an arbitrary dichotomy. Now, my daughter, the one I embarrass on Twitter, is a geneticist. Another way I embarrass her is by talking about genetics. Says, oh, Dad, you should not talk about genetics. You can't even pronounce anything correctly. <laughs> you tend to say phenotype, you say phenotype, you tend to say, I don't know, locus or locus, I forget which. Anyway, one of those things, all those things, I get them all wrong. You get the vocabulary wrong. I shouldn't talk about genetics. But like me, she suffers from hay fever. And maybe that's genetic, I don't know. She and I both suffer from hay fever. And so I was really interested to see her medicine she was taking. I mean, my daughter is not a little girl anymore. I have to remind myself of this sometimes. She's actually uh, 35 years old now. <laughs> and here we, have, uh, here we have the advice on her particular uh, medicine packet, what you give, what it says is, first of all, if you're giving this medicine to children, then you need to weigh your child. Uh, guy, the child of nine years of age will weigh about 30 kilograms. That's four and a half stone. These are the wonderful imperial measures that the British are looking forward to. They're looking forward to getting this back again. You know. <laughs> they, they really want to know how, uh, you know, the, the, what is it, 16 ounces in a pound and uh, 14 pounds in a stone and, uh, you know, something like that. It's a really wonderful system. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, do not give to children who weigh less than 30 kilograms. Do not give to children under two years. This is rather strange. Having said that a nine years child will weigh about 30 kilograms, suddenly we have somehow two years and 30 kilograms together in some particular way. And so, what is what about the dosing? Now, this is personalized medicine at the cutting edge. This is where it really happens. This is where the personalization really takes place here. Uh, adults and children over 12 years and over, one tablet once a day. Oh, okay, good. Now, what about the, the, younger, the younger patient here? Children of 2 to 11 years who weigh more than 30 kilograms. Very, very obese two-year-old children. Now, what, sort of, what sort of dose should these children get? Oh, well, it turns out one tablet once a day. They get exactly the same dose as the adults. That's the same dose as the adults. And then we have a look at uh, children of 2 to 11 years who weigh less than kilograms. Do not give this medicine. That, ladies and gentlemen, that's the reality of personalized medicine out there. And as someone who works in the pharmaceutical industry, I'm always baffled by this.
this. If you came to marketing and you said, we'll propose one dose in and another for men, they'd say, oh, that's far, far too complicated. Far, far too complicated to dose by sex. Merck have one dose for everybody. They will kill us in the market if we come for something more uh, complicated than this. But on the other hand, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom talking about unlocking the power of DNA. Wow, that's you know, really exciting. So, finally, I leave with this particular thought. The supply of truth greatly exceeds its demand. Thank you.